Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. I've got a theme song for our campaign. And here it comes. Just listen to it. We're crazy. <laughs> crazy for things. So lonely. On the last day of the 1992 election, while his Democratic and Republican rivals crisscrossed the country, Ross Perot took to the stage in Dallas, Texas, and playfully mocked his entire presidential campaign. To the delight of some 4,000 supporters, and at Perot's request, the in-house band began to play Patsy Cline's 1961 country ballad, Crazy, a song about being hopelessly in love. As campaign songs go, it was both an utterly bizarre choice and perfectly fitting. It was one last act of political defiance by a presidential candidate who defied all political convention. Now don't worry, folks. We got buses lined up outside to take you back to the insane asylum right after this over. Be all right. Pro wasn't crazy, at least not in the clinical sense, though his political opponents and many in the media called him nuts. He was such a funny little character, even though he was a brilliant man. For months, the funny-looking, twangy Texas billionaire promised voters they could take back America from the, quote, cesspool of government bureaucrats and alligator skin boot-wearing lobbyists. It's time to take out the trash and clean out the barn. Perot rode a wave of voter anger from long shot to front runner in the spring of 1992. While America watched the dizzying and often turbulent roller coaster ride that was his campaign, running as a self-funded independent willing to spend some $60 million of his own fortune, Perot reinvigorated American populism by harnessing the power of television in a way no one had ever done before. When I looked at what Perot was threatening to spend, it seemed like this could be a completely revolutionary way of trying to run for president. At a time when public trust in government had plummeted, he chastised both Democrats and Republicans for being in the pocket of Capitol Hill lobbyists and special interest groups. He warned workers of the economic disaster the pending North American Free Trade Agreement would produce for them. And he berated America's politicians for a ballooning federal deficit. We cannot spend our children's money. We are looking on the edge of a revolution of young people who are starting to realize that we, our generation, have put them $4 trillion in debt, and they don't like it, and they shouldn't. America has seen third-party challengers and conventional politicians shake up the political system before. But no one rewrote, rearranged, redrew the national debate quite like Ross Perot, who promoted himself as a savior to the nation. He was just a cultural phenomenon. Perot proved that someone without conventional political and governing experience could and should be taken seriously. He also revealed the chaos an unpredictable outsider might bring along with him. History may be written by the winners, but in American presidential politics, history is often shaped by the long shots. God bless you, and God bless America. These are the stories of the campaigns of presidential primary losers, the candidates who didn't make it onto the final ballot but still changed how we see America. No generation can choose the age or circumstance in which it is born, but through leadership, it can choose to make the age in which it is born an age of enlightenment, an age of jobs, and peace and justice. These are the stories of America's presidential primary battles, the contest for the most powerful office in the world. I'm Connor Powell, and I'll be your host. For the last decade, I've covered some of the world's most violent conflicts and turbulent international elections as a foreign correspondent. Now I'm back in the U.S., digging into the fascinating tales of campaigns that bring a kaleidoscope of color to our black and white history. You're listening to Long Shots. 
This is the story of a wily, chaotic billionaire named Ross Perot. I have lived the American dream. I came from a very modest background. Nobody's been luckier than I've been. Ross Perot didn't start life as an eccentric billionaire, but instead was born during the Great Depression in what Texans call a two-horse town. As a young boy in Texarkana, Perot got an early start in business, first delivering newspapers from the saddle of a pony, and then later as a country hustler of sorts, buying and selling equipment and animals in hopes of making a quick buck. After graduating from the Naval Academy and serving in the Navy, Perot returned home to Texas to work for IBM. He left to launch his own company, Electronic Data Systems, in 1962. Processing and modernizing Medicare records for the federal government made Perot America's first tech billionaire and one of the most politically connected businessmen in the country. I became aware of Ross Perot when I was still covering Capitol Hill. That is NBC News longtime correspondent and anchor Andrea Mitchell. During the Reagan administration, she says Perot was a fixture in Washington, always outspoken. Perot had long advocated for the families of veterans, especially prisoners of war, even leading a delegation to war-torn Vietnam in 1970 to tour prison camps. This trip will provide the North Vietnamese with a classic opportunity to prove what they have been saying, that the American prisoners are receiving humane treatment. After the Vietnam War ended, Perot became convinced the communist Vietnamese government secretly held hundreds of American prisoners of war. Perot was the movement's most vocal advocate. He became a hero of the military in that sense. There was no evidence to support this conspiracy theory. Still, Perot lobbied Pentagon commanders, pushed Congress to hold hearings, and publicly hammered President Ronald Reagan on the issue. He was trying to organize around the issue of missing POWs in Vietnam and using his own resources, considerable resources, to try to raise that issue. Perot even ignored the White House and launched unauthorized and possibly illegal back-channel negotiations with Vietnamese officials. The move infuriated Reagan, who sent Vice President George Bush to tell Perot to knock it off. Conversations between the two Texans were, well, heated. There was a tremendous resentment against Bush, 41, because he felt that Bush as vice president had not taken him seriously. From then on, the animosity between Bush and Perot only grew. Political journalists often joked that if Texas wasn't so big, there wouldn't have been enough room for both of them. In 1991, when President Bush launched the Gulf War, Perot was proudly critical of the military offensive, says Jim Squires, Perot's 1992 campaign spokesman. Even though he is a very strong military supporter, he did not like the decision to go into the Gulf. He was against any war where the people uh, we shot first and they didn't. And besides, he couldn't figure out uh, what they had done to us. When U.S. forces easily defeated Saddam Hussein's army and pushed the Iraqi military out of Kuwait, President Bush's popularity soared. He had an approval rating of 89%. Pundits wondered if Democrats would even run a candidate. Privately, Perot contemplated challenging Bush for the White House as a Democrat. Family and friends dismissed the idea, but Perot persisted. Then the U.S. economy stalled. Unemployment is not getting any better. The new numbers are out. They're still at a five-year high. And Bush's popularity cratered. Conservative TV pundit Pat Buchanan launched an unprecedented challenge against Bush for the Republican nomination. Can we afford four more years of broken promises? Read my lips. Send a message. Read our lips. Vote Pat Buchanan for president. In the fall of 1991, Perot was invited to the Harvard Institute of Politics to talk about his opposition to the Gulf War. Perot's lawyer, former Republican Texas gubernatorial candidate Tom Luce, was attending the Institute as a fellow. So was Jim Squires. After the talk, Perot, Luce, and Squires had dinner near Harvard. 
and talked about the dismal state of American politics. I think the Pearl campaign was born uh, in that session. We talked a lot about the not coming 1992 election. Mr. Perot told us how he was not fond of Bush, and he certainly was not fond of Clinton because he was concerned about his character. He was, thought that we were going to have a campaign where both sides spent taxpayer money to attack each other, try to assassinate the character of the opponent. Squires doesn't remember who first brought up the idea of an independent third-party run. We kind of egged him on saying, you know, maybe you should do that. But he remembers vividly how Perot responded. He talks with his eyes. He has these wonderful blue eyes that are very expressive. And he sparked on the idea of a third party that night. Once dinner ended, Squires thought nothing more of the conversation. When we left there, there was no indication that he was going to do it. We didn't think that Perot was serious about it. Whether or not Perot was serious, the idea circulated among a very small group of people. Squires mentioned it to his mentor, John Siegenthaler, the longtime journalist, was also a friend of Perot's, and set in motion the events that would lead to the charismatic Texans' unheard of third party candidacy for president. It started with a call to the King of Cable. In the winter of 1992, CNN's Larry King received a call from his friend, journalist, and former John F. Kennedy advisor, John Siegenthaler. Billionaire Ross Perot, he said, was mulling an independent run for president. Siegenthaler urged King, who had a highly rated primetime cable TV show, to have Perot on as a guest. Larry King. It all happened through my show, as Ross always admitted, during the show. A few weeks later, on February 20th, 1992, just as the Democratic and Republican primaries were heating up, Pro appeared on CNN to talk about the state of the U.S. economy and the dysfunction in Washington. I asked him, because he, he was so political, I asked him if he intended to, you know, as a businessman, run for president. He wasn't a member of any particular party. And he said no. And then halfway through the show, I said, I just want to ask you again. And he said, well, no. At the end of the show, three minutes to go, I said, okay, Mr. Pro, is there any circumstance under which you would run for president? And he looked at the camera and said, now, all these folks who constantly call in writing, If you feel so strongly about this, number one, I will not run as either a Democrat or Republican because I will not sell out to anybody but to the American people. And I will sell out to them. So you'd run as an independent? Number two, you, the people, are that serious? You register me in 50 states. And if you're not willing to organize and do that, then this is all just talk. Wait, wait, wait. With me, Larry. Are you I'm saying, saying to the ordinary folks, and I don't want any this machine. This is a draft Ross Perot. No, no, no. no, no. I'm not asking to be drafted. Perot vowed to spend his own money and asked would-be supporters to donate $5 just so they would have skin in the game. I saw Ross Perot at dinner two nights later, and kind of as a joke, I gave him $5. And he said, you're the first person that's done this. And I said, well, what do you think? He said, nothing will come of it. That was Clay Mulford, Perot's then son-in-law, and soon to be the campaign's legal counsel. They didn't put out a number on Mary King or any place else. But people began looking up how to call Ross Perot. So the office was overwhelmed with calls. The public reaction was so strong uh, that Perot systems couldn't handle it. America, it seemed, wanted the reluctant businessman to run. In response, Perot set up a phone bank in Dallas with a dedicated 1-800 number. Within days, more than a million calls of support poured in, while the grassroots draft Perot movement worked to get the billionaire's name on the ballot in all 50 states. What we were going to do was run the antithesis of a normal presidential campaign. 
Ross Perot started off the 1992 election as just another businessman with an opinion, talking on cable news. In May, polls showed him beating incumbent President George Bush and his Democratic challenger, Bill Clinton. Amazingly, he drew support away from both men equally, uniting dissatisfied Democrats and Republicans. Perot's rise in the polls was fueled by his near daily radio and television appearances. Look out, George Bush! Here comes H. Ross Perot! These shows allowed ordinary Americans to register their frustrations directly with Perot, similar to social media today. Perot was on Larry King's show so often, political journalists jokingly called the CNN studio Perot's campaign headquarters. With each appearance, Perot promoted himself as a reforming businessman who would break the deadlock in Washington. See, I'm the only guy that talks numbers. Mm -hmm. I love this. Nobody else will even talk about it. I've I've said it's like a crazy ant in the basement. Everybody knows she's there, but nobody talks about her. I'm talking about it. And it would fight for everyday Americans being screwed by ruinous trade deals. Sounds familiar? He was saying the things that a big portion of America wanted to hear. A cross between Yoda and a more charming Mr. Burns, Perot captivated the country with pie charts, a tiny metal pointer, and a message of economic nationalism. We've got to rebuild our great country. We've got to make our country the envy of the world again. And I can't sleep until the words made in the USA once again become the world standard treasure. These media appearances were as entertaining as they were substantive remembers former Fox News political correspondent Carl Cameron. It was remarkable. I mean, the idea that people would sit there and watch a guy read off a piece of cardboard and explaining the national debt or the deficit. In a time before campaign websites, Facebook, and Twitter, Perot broke through the political noise with a clear and singular message. The candidate is Ross Perot. The issue is the national debt. If you're too young to remember Ross Perot's presidential campaign, it's hard now to understand just how enthralled America was with him. Presidential races are always interesting. He doubled the interest, and he was the interest. Perot's TV appearances were played and replayed on both news programs and on late night comedy shows. Because I can't deal with a problem unless I can feel it, touch it, smell it, taste it, and touch a little more. (laughs) He was a showman. You know, we didn't have reality TV then, and we certainly didn't have social media, but he was a communicator, got his message through. To put it in perspective, on the night Bill Clinton won the California Democratic primary and officially nailed down his party's nomination, the Arkansas governor played second fiddle to Perot, Andrea Mitchell. That night on Nightly News, instead of the incumbent president, or Bill Clinton being the lead story, the lead story was the correspondent covering Ross Perot because he was ahead of both President Bush and the Democratic challenger in the polls in a three-way race. Perot made Americans feel he wasn't running for president because he wanted to be president, but because America was broken and he alone had the good business sense to fix it. Perot was not pandering to get votes for Perot. It was all about the issues. If Congress and Washington lobbyists were the cause of government gridlock, then Perot proposed replacing representative democracy with direct democracy, allowing Americans from the comfort of their couches to vote via a 1-800 number on key legislation before Congress. They want to program the people and tell them what to think. I want the people to think. Now, this idea was crazy. It undermined the entire American political system, everything our founding fathers believed in and created with the Constitution. But just like everything Perot did, it struck a nerve with voters fed up with politics as usual. The party's over, and it's time for the cleanup crew. As Perot made his case nightly on TV, a growing army of volunteers began to organize across the country. Most were middle-aged white men. Many had never participated in politics before. All were deeply committed to shaking up the status quo. 
it was a very odd campaign in the sense that there were people popping up all over the place that wanted to support Perot, but there wasn't really that great of a political structure to accommodate them. Despite having no leader, an organic grassroots draft Perot movement sprung into action in an attempt to register Perot on the ballot of all 50 states and the District of Columbia. This type of national registration drive had never before been attempted in modern American politics. It's really a rigged system. The complexity and variety of state laws, according to Bill Hilsman, who briefly worked on the pro campaign, make it nearly impossible for independent candidates to register nationwide. The system is set up just to make it easy on Democrats and Republicans. You see... Democrats and Republicans are automatically registered on election ballots. Independents, on the other hand, face a daunting labyrinth of state-based requirements. The whole thing was designed not to encourage competition, but to diminish competition. Each state has different rules and different filing deadlines. In some, supporters aren't allowed to sign a petition for an independent candidate if they had previously voted in a Democratic or Republican primary. In others... One, just one invalid signature, invalidates all of the signatures. Mulford was tasked to bring order to this chaotic local ballot drive. It took a tremendous amount of work, and I had no idea how to do it. Ultimately, the grassroots army, armed with just telephone lines and fax machines, remember those, succeeded with grit and pure perseverance. Volunteers collected signatures from more than 5 million people and registered Perot on all 51 ballots. In comparison, in 2000, the Green Party only managed to register its candidate, Ralph Nader, on 43 ballots. By late June, Perot's lead over Bush and Clinton was up to 10 points nationally, and he led in 49 states. Despite the billionaire spending just a third of the amount of money his rivals had, the long shot, had now become the front-runner. We are in the midst of a generational war. Boomers just die. Xers, Karens, millennials, entitled brats, Gen Z, ungrateful TikTokers. I'm Carol Costello, a veteran journalist, and I have a new podcast series called I Hate Your Generation. It invites people in different generations to talk frankly, face to face, about everything from cancel culture to racial justice to socialism. Contentious, yes, but healing too. If you don't get your kit or that old guy, I Hate Your Generation is for you. Listen wherever you get your favorite podcast. It's available now. Pro is always looking for a way out to not run. Surging national polls aside, it was always a little unclear to many around him just how committed Ross Perot was to winning the presidency, says Jim Squires. I may be the only person who will say this to you. Ross Perot never had any intention to run for president, to be president. From the start, Perot never thought his supporters would register him in all 50 states. It was an impossible task. That was a, his exit strategy from day one. There was no way he could, that he had to live up to that promise that he made on Larry King because there's no way he's going to get on all the ballots. Perot's only goal, insists Squires, was to control the campaign conversation and to force the two parties to face the economic realities of the day. So he and I had, from the day one, uh, sort of an understanding that this is going nowhere, but it's a good thing to do for the country. This was my agreement. Mr. Pro, you know you're not going to win. But if some chance you did, I am not going to Washington with you. And he said, don't worry, I'm not going either. Squires said Perot tried to quit the race several times, including when unflattering articles appeared, insinuating Perot was an anti-Semite. As he used to say, everything has rules, even mud wrestling has rules. 
but presidential politics doesn't. Regardless of how he felt at the start of the campaign, others say some days Perot felt the pull of the presidency. He hired some of the most respected names in American politics, including Ed Rollins, who led Ronald Reagan's landslide victory eight years earlier, and Hamilton Jeerden, who helped Jimmy Carter win the presidency in 76. These were players in the very political establishment Pro had long criticized. Their hiring also served notice to the American people. Perot was a serious candidate. There was a conflict there from the very beginning. Ed Rollins wanted to run a conventional presidential campaign. Perot resisted, refusing to spend money on attack ads. Eddie immediately began to leak to the press that we didn't know what we were doing because we didn't behave like a normal campaign. Well, if we behave like a normal campaign, we undercut our, our position that we weren't a normal campaign and that we wanted to run things differently. Pro did, however, start appearing at traditional political events, like the National Convention of the NAACP. We are happy to hear your message today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ross Perot of Texas, would you give him a big welcome as he comes? Despite hiring some of the top talent in politics, Perot proudly boasted of ignoring their advice. I don't have any speechwriters, and what you hear from me comes straight from my heart. Minutes later, Perot awkwardly referred to African Americans as you people, proving what happens when you improvise a political speech. I don't have to tell you who gets hurt first when this sort of thing happens, do I? You, your people do. Your people do. I know that. You know that. The crowd began to yell and boo, while the press questioned if Perot was ready for the national stage or just a product of a safe television media strategy. Then, internal turmoil erupted, with nearly a dozen of Perot's top staff quitting over the direction, or lack thereof, of the campaign. We began with the latest bombshell from the campaign trail. Everybody is talking about Ross Perot. Hours later, on July 16th, Perot quit his independent bid for the White House. He said the Democratic Party with Bill Clinton and Al Gore at the helm had been revitalized. And he said that if he stayed in the race, he would cause the election to be thrown to the House of Representatives. This whole thing was motivated by love of country, not personal. You know, I don't have any drive to be president of the United States. The improbable and chaotic roller coaster campaign came to an abrupt halt. He dropped out of the race when the media started to really try to pin him down. He didn't like being under that sort of media scrutiny. Despite dropping out, Perot encouraged supporters to continue the 50-state ballot effort and privately told key backers if anyone thought he had really quit, they would be in for an October surprise. In the days before a frustrated Ross Perot quit the 1992 election, his public image had taken a beating. He had been accused of being an anti-Semite and a difficult personality by former campaign aides. As the election wore on, Perot gained a begrudging respect for his Democratic rivals. I think that Gore being on the ticket gave him another good reason to quit. Initially, Perot saw little in Bill Clinton that he liked. He long had questions about the Arkansas governor's character. But Perot admired Senator Al Gore, Clinton's running mate, ever the military man. He respected Gore's difficult decision to enlist in the Army during Vietnam. As the son of a U.S. senator, Gore could have easily avoided serving in the military. When Clinton chose Gore, Perot took notice, says Jim Squires, who remembers the Texan being in awe of the young, dynamic Democratic pair. He said to me, you know, I think those young fellows might have it together. They might be the right thing for this country. The combination of a successful Democratic National Convention and Pro's departure sent Bill Clinton's approval ratings through the roof. With a similar economic message, the Democrats were now in control of the race. But while Pro quit the campaign, he never stopped trying to influence it. I had a conversation with Ross on a number of occasions. That's Mickey Cantor. Clinton's 1992 campaign chair. Perot publicly offered to endorse Bush or Clinton if either candidate would adopt his budget reduction and economic plans. Both campaigns sent high-level delegations to woo Perot. 
a sign of the maverick billionaire's potential sway. Given his personal contempt for Bush, an endorsement of the Republican incumbent was never really on the table. In Perot's mind, Bush was everything that was wrong with Washington. But there was a lot of overlap between Perot and Clinton, Cantor explains. Clinton's uh, and, and his rhetoric and, and what he was talking about in the campaign, frankly, was almost exactly where Ross was in terms of the budget. The Clinton team, though, felt Perot went too far on Social Security, and talks broke down during the summer. Social Security is a vital program to millions of Americans, and we weren't about to do anything to cut it. Perot always left open the possibility of a return, repeatedly saying it was up to his volunteers. So at the same time the pro camp was negotiating with its rivals, the billionaire businessman was plotting a comeback. With a sly grin, he told CBS News there was a one in a thousand chance he would return. It turns out that one in a thousand chance really just meant he was getting back in the race. My decision in July hurt you. I apologize. I thought it was I was doing the right thing. I made a mistake. Ross Perot officially re-entered the 1992 presidential campaign on October 1st, just five weeks before voters were set to cast their ballots. The volunteers on their own forged ahead. The day we were on the ballot in all 50 states, the volunteers requested that I come back in because the political parties had not responded to their concerns. He felt that if he kept going, he could push the debate further in his direction. The race Perot re-entered was dramatically different than the one he abandoned. His commanding lead in the polls were gone. Many of his supporters were angry or just moved on. Bill Clinton was now the frontrunner, and he too had a laser-like focus on the economy. What is George Bush doing about our economic problems? Four years ago, he promised 15 million new jobs by this time, and he's over 14 million short. Ever the innovator, Perot defied conventional campaign logic, buying time on network TV to run a series of 30-minute infomercials. He realized that's the only way he would have a platform for the types of things he wanted to say. Tonight, Ross Perot, plain talk about jobs, debt, and the Washington mess. Sitting behind a large desk, using a few dozen cardboard pie charts, and a pointer, a sober and serious Perot talked directly to voters. He criticized both Democrats and Republicans for short-sighted economic policies. I'll tell you one of the reasons we fell off the edge of, edge of the cliff. We got into trickle-down economics, and it didn't trickle. Political pundits predicted voters would be bored by this simplistic presentation and tune out Perot's message. They couldn't have been more wrong. Some 17 million people tuned in to watch the first one. That's more viewers than the Major League Baseball game that came after it. For the next month, as his ratings soared, Perot preempted hit network sitcoms like CBS's Major Dad, educating and entertaining Americans with his folksy homespun economic decisions. Since we're dealing with voodoo economics, a great young lady from Louisiana sent me this voodoo stick, and I will use it as my pointer tonight. And certainly it's appropriate because, as you and I know, we are in deep voodoo. Perot had talked his way back into the political conversation and the race, and even managed to score an invitation to the three presidential debates. The struggle to make a family can be so painful, sometimes you just have to laugh about it. That's why I created IVFU, a podcast about the pain, joy, angst, and love of trying to make a family the new-fashioned way. Join me for uninhibited, honest conversations with patients, doctors, egg donors, adoptive parents, and more. I'm your host, Sam Shaber, singer-songwriter, storyteller, and infertile mama. Find us at IVFUpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you stream your pods, because it's all about being a family.
One of the most fascinating and I think illuminating stories I was told about Ross Perot came from Mickey Cantor. At the time of the first debate, Clinton was leading in the polls, but the election was very much in the air because no one knew what, if any, impact Perot would have on the vote. On the evening of the first debate, Cantor was sitting with a Democratic nominee in their green room. When there was a knock at the door, it was Ross Perot. He said, Mickey, can I talk to Bill? I'll let Cantor tell the rest of the story. I said, Ross, he's getting ready now. What do you want to talk about? He says, I need some information. I said, well, I'll give it to you. He said, look, where do I walk in on this stage? And I said, Ross, you've never, you didn't do a walkthrough? He said, no. He says, I don't know where to walk in. I don't know, you know, when I'm supposed to go on. I don't know who goes first. And so, of course, I briefed him and told him what, what he was, uh, had been planned and what had been agreed to and so on and so forth. But what was interesting about that to me was, in fact, it was is both charming and, I thought, impressive. Ross Perot was there to talk about the issues he cared about. He didn't care about the staging. He didn't care about makeup. He didn't care about the lighting. What he cared about was what was said. Perot won that first debate hands down controlling the entire narrative with his folksy and straightforward ideas. He channeled many Americans' sense of economic uncertainty in a way that neither Bush or Clinton could. He was a, a terrific because he wasn't uptight. Uh, he just said what he believed, and he said it in a very uh, interesting and, and provocative way, and I think people liked it. At the second debate, Perot picked up his economic message, right where he left off railing against NAFTA and arguing it was time to stop sending jobs overseas. Pay a dollar an hour for your labor. Have no health care. That's the most expensive single element, making a car. Have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement. And you don't care about anything but making money. There will be a giant sucking sound going south. President Bush, on the other hand, trailing Clinton in the polls, and getting beat up by both his rivals on the economy, came into the debate intent on going on the offensive. George Bush had come into the second debate prepared to attack Clinton's character. That was his game plan. That was Carol Simpson, former ABC News anchor and the moderator of the second debate in Richmond. She remembers the audience demanding an end to the mudslinging. The amount of time the candidates have spent in this campaign trashing their opponents' character and and their programs is depressingly large. Why can't your discussions and proposals reflect the genuine complexity and the difficulty of the issues? It was as if someone had stuck a pin in George H.W. Bush. He just deflated when he heard that. He was off his game for the rest of the night. The debate conversation largely stayed on economic issues, but it also turned personal. There was the pivotal moment during the debate when a young black woman was asking whether the candidates felt the recession the same way ordinary people were. Bill Clinton jumped off his stool. He walked straight up to her in the audience and did one of his I feel your pain kind of thing. You know people who lost their job, lost their home. Uh Bill Clinton, who has this Thing. He has that charisma. You feel you really have his attention. He won the debate at that moment because everybody said, he gets it. He knows what we're going through. And George Bush does not. Perot would set the agenda only to have Clinton take it and personalize it. Voters wanted, it turned out, not only someone who could fix the nation's economic problems, but also someone who could empathize with them. We begin tonight with proof positive that this has been one of the strangest presidential campaigns in modern times. In the final days of the 1992 election, following a month of three successful debates and rising poll numbers, the roller coaster ride that was the Ross Perot campaign once again abruptly jumped off the rails. In an interview with CBS's 60 Minutes, Perot plunged headfirst into a distracting and needless political controversy, spinning a story about why he really quit the race that summer. Perot claimed on national TV, Republican operatives were plotting to ruin his daughter Caroline's wedding by spreading rumors she was a lesbian and that someone had called to warn him 
He had seen a doctored photograph that they were going to give the tabloids to smear my daughter before her wedding and that they were going to disrupt the wedding in the church. It was just conspiracy 101. It didn't make any sense. Pro offered no proof, only an ever-shifting assortment of details. He, he looked like the kook everybody wanted him to be, and he was not. The Bush White House happily seized on the story and painted Perot as a loony, a crazy, a conspiracy theorist. Which led the president's spokesman to say Mr. Perot is a paranoid with crazy ideas. With this one interview, Perot once again went from being a folksy advocate for the disgruntled voter to an erratic, unpredictable outsider who left a trail of chaos in his wake. I think the whole, you know, tragic comedy of getting out of the race and getting back into the race and conspiracy theories, that damaged his credibility. We're crazy. <laughs> crazy for feeling so As the votes are being tallied on election night, Ross Perot hosted a victory party and danced to Patsy Cline's crazy. The Texas billionaire didn't win the election. Governor Clinton is now president-elect Bill Clinton. The night instead belonged to the man from Hope, Arkansas. Bill Clinton crushed his opponents, winning 370 electoral college votes and dislodged President George Bush from the White House. But Ross Perot received nearly 20 million votes, one of the best showings ever for a third-party candidate. But what about Ross Perot, the use of television and private money? Has it changed the political landscape for the long haul? I think forever, Tom. We have a candidate who basically avoided the press, avoided large crowds, avoided any kind of scrutiny, and a give and take, and went directly on television. The Texas billionaire's impact on the 1992 election has always been passionately debated. The Republicans like to say that Poro was a spoiler. Many people, Bush included, feel that that really hurt his re-election. In fact... It was pretty much even in terms of whose Perot's votes came from. It came from both parties. Whatever the impact in 1992, the lasting legacy of the Perot phenomenon is still felt today. We didn't reform politics, but what we did do uh, was uh, his campaign became the basis for the uh, Republican contract with America. Newt Gingrich's legislative manifesto was modeled on Ross Perot's economic agenda. The then little known Georgia congressman actively courted Perot voters in 1994, and Republicans swept to power that same year, taking control of both houses of Congress for the first time since 1952. Just two years after backing the independent businessman, Perot's supporters overwhelmingly voted for Republicans and have stayed with the GOP. For a large part of the Republican Party, Perot's concerns are their concerns. He railed against free trade, made balancing the federal budget a kitchen table conversation, and sowed anti-establishment distrust in government. These are the hallmarks of the modern Republican Party, which had been for ages the party of business. But Perot was just one in a long line of presidential hopefuls who pushed these ideas. George Wallace, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Pat Buchanan, and Donald Trump all embrace these themes at one time or another. No, what Perot brought to American politics that was unique, even revolutionary, was his unpredictable nature. I think what he brought to it was a sense that there is, in addition to the two parties, there can be a third way. Before and after him, really up until Donald Trump, presidential hopefuls, even ones with anti-establishment views, were fairly predictable. They were part of a party. They raised money from donors. They held public office. The answer to an establishment. Perot proved that if you had money, the resources, and the media platform, you didn't have to be predictable. But more importantly, there was barely any political consequence to being unpredictable, to being erratic. If you had your own money and something to say, there was an opportunity for you in modern American politics. You could go on TV, or now social media, and just bypass the party and the media. As well-intentioned as he was, and as decent a human being as he was, uh, all of the impact that he had on the system, not all good. Perot failed to translate this power into the presidency, 
America in 1992 just wasn't ready yet for an eccentric and temperamental CEO president. He probably was the foreshadowing of what was to come with Donald Trump. Trump, like Perot, rose to prominence by being unpredictable, by not worrying about conventional political norms. With his personal fortune and Twitter account, Trump rode roughshod over his GOP opponents, the Republican Party, and narrowly beat Hillary Clinton in 2016. Trump succeeded where Perot failed, and the consequences of being unpredictable are on full display today. You've been listening to Long Shots. And thank you to our guests, Larry King, Jim Squires, Clayton Mulfer, Bill Hillsman, Carol Simpson, and Andrea Mitchell, who you can catch every day as she hosts the Andrea Mitchell Reports at noon Eastern on MSNBC. Long Shots was created by me, Connor Powell, and produced by Gary Scott of Inside Voices. Our sound editor was J.C. Swadek. Sound design was done by Logan Heftel. Thanks to Jake Blue Note for the Long Shots theme song aptly called Linger. And thank you to our social media strategist, Madeline Rossini. Thanks to Starburns Audio for the use of their studios. And a special thanks to the team at Karamis, who built our website at longshotspodcast.com. Karamis is a leader in creative, strategy, and software development. Whether you're a Fortune 500 company or a newly formed startup, the team at Karamis will get your concept to the market quickly. This is the final episode of the series. Don't worry, though, we'll be back with another season soon, especially if you hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening. Leave us a review on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the Good Pods app, and recommend us to a friend. Until next time, I'm Connor Powell, and I hope you enjoyed Long Shots. 